Sarah, you may uh, start your presentation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, a very, very happy European Day of, of Languages. I hope you've all been celebrating today in some way. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to, then towards the end of my presentation, um, I'll point out some, some ways in which you can still do that because it's in and around the day. In fact, here in Graz, uh, our big celebration is, is tomorrow. Um, so just to say really that what I would like to do in this presentation is to try and present linguistic diversity um, as a richness, as something that can strengthen learning um, rather than as an obstacle, um, as a kind of obstacle we need to overcome. So um, how, how do, we, do we go about doing that and show you that the European Centre for Modern Languages of the Council of Europe has many resources that um, may be able to help you in, in your classrooms. And I thought I would begin just by looking at some of the, the myths around bilingualism, plurilingualism, multilingualism. I'll come back to the, the terminology later. Um, because sometimes it's not the fact that there are many languages that cause the challenge. It's what we think about those languages, what we, what our beliefs are in terms of language learning and language acquisition that can somehow get in the road. Um, so now, do I move the slide? Yes. Ha. Ah. Okay. So um, on this slide, I'm just going to start with this one. Bilingualism will delay language acquisition in children. There's a lot of people believe that. Um, you sometimes even hear um, people in the medical profession um, advising parents to speak to their children in, in just one language because it may delay acquisition. Well, the research shows that isn't true. Um, and even if there is a delay, it's simply because the child is processing different languages. Um, and of course, they will eventually speak those different languages. So it's not an issue at all. This one, the language spoken in the home will have a negative effect if it's different from the language of school, the language of schooling. I'm just going to leave that one for you to think about. Or this one, one person, one language. Um, so if, you, if your children are growing up bilingually, do you speak to them in one language and your partner perhaps in a different language and you always stick to those languages? Do children mix the languages? And do they have equal and perfect knowledge of them? And do they end up with split personalities? Well, I don't know what you think, but surprise, surprise, the research shows us very clearly that these are myths. And these are myths that are so deeply embedded um, in our cultures that we as educators need to make sure we realize that they are myths and spread that word and educate people to understand um, that these, these things are in fact incorrect. I've taken these myths from one of our projects, which is called Malady, but you can see it there in, in the web link um, and these slides will be shared. And there you can find much more information about each of these statements um, and ways that you can use them with, with your learners and with parents to discuss these, these myths. And what about you? Do you consider yourself to be monolingual, bilingual, plurilingual? It's a really interesting question because having grown up, I suppose, in, in what is traditionally a very monolingual country, Scotland, I probably would have said, as a, as a young person, I was monolingual. But actually, there was a lot of Scots that I was listening to. Um, and my parents were from Ireland. So sometimes I heard um, Irish Gaelic. So in fact, very few of us really grew up completely monolingually. And even if we do, what, what matters is that we have the potential to learn other, other languages. And sometimes people don't consider themselves bilingual because they think they need to be fluent in both both languages, but that, of course, is, is not at all the case. What about your environment where you live? What languages are, are, are out there in, in your environment? Just have a think. 
When I think about the city of Graz in Austria, if I get on the tram here to go home from work, I can probably in the space of 20 minutes hear 10, 12 different languages, many of which I have no idea what language it is being spoken, but there's that real rich cultural diversity. And then your school, what languages are visible or audible in your school and in your classroom? And here I'm not just thinking about languages on the curriculum, I'm thinking about the languages the learners bring with them or the staff brings with them. Um, whatever answer you have to those two questions tells you something about how you value languages. If a school you, where you, you can't hear or see many different languages, then something's missing because there will be learners in that school who have other languages and we need to make sure these are heard and, and valued. And if we look at this quote, what do you think of that quote? If that's true and language is so profoundly linked to our, our sense of identity, in fact, if, if we read some of the research um, produced by, by Dr. David Little, he says that the, the language of the home is the default medium of the child's self-concept their self-awareness, their consciousness, their discursive thinking, and their agency. It is thus the cognitive tool that they cannot help but apply to formal learning, which includes mastering the language of schooling. And if that's the case, what impact is there going to be on learning if we leave out a part of someone's identity? I think that's a really important question we need to ask ourselves, because if part of their identity is not being acknowledged, it's going to have a serious impact on learning. And if we then think about the learner and that focusing on the learner and what they bring to the, the learning environment, for me, that takes me to the Council of Europe's holistic view of language learning. Just to point out to you, the web link there will take you to the new portal for language policy um, from our colleagues in Strasbourg, which has a wealth of resources you might be interested in. But this diagram sums it up because at the top is the learner. The learner is the person who matters. With all of the languages, partial competences, dialects that they have in their repertoire or that they will be able to develop. And learning one language impacts on the learning of another. And we at the Council of Europe tend to use the word plurilingual when referring to the person and the languages in their repertoire, whereas we use multilingual more to describe a society or a place of work where there are different languages. I'm sure you're all very familiar with the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages one of the Council's main um, tools for language education. And in that document, they talk about the plurilingual ideal, which is to, to develop a linguistic repertoire to which all knowledge and experience of language contributes and in which languages interrelate and interreact. And that's really important for us as teachers, whether we're language teachers, whether whether we are language and subject teachers, whether we are primary teachers, we need to think about the place of language and the ways in which languages interact. But that's all very well, isn't it? That's the, that's the philosophy, that's the beliefs. What about resources? How can we actually help it, you put these ideals into practice? So I'm going to turn now to some of the resources produced by the ECML in Graz. I hope some of them will be of interest to you. But just to say before I start that this is just a tiny sample. Um, there isn't time to go into all of the resources, but I hope you might be tempted to, to go on our website and find something for, for your class. I'd like to start with this one because the early years really matter. And it's interesting if you look at research at the moment in, in language education, there is a big focus on early years. And that's because that's when those attitudes towards different languages and different cultures begin. And of course, in a nursery school setting or kindergarten setting, what do the children pick 
stop on. They pick up on the attitude of their educator, of their teacher, of their classroom assistant, who may well never have studied languages. It won't normally be part of their, their training, but that doesn't really matter. What matters are is the way in which they respond to the diversity in their classroom. And this is a tool for people working in the, in the early years. It's also just as valid for primary school that looks at different, um, different descriptors. How can you adopt appropriate behavior? How can you cooperate with families? How can you create a learning environment that respects linguistic diversity? Um, it's available in English, French, and German. You can download it from our website. You can use it yourself or you can use it with, with your colleagues and dip in and out of it. And it's been trialed and used in a number of countries in, in Europe. We spoke, I mentioned cooperation. Cooperation, of course, is very important with, with, with parents for different reasons. Parents who have come to, to your country, um, perhaps as, as migrants, they may not feel completely at ease coming into the, the local school because they don't master the language, because they have a, a different culture, a different way of life. So what can you do to bring them into the school? Because their involvement in their child's learning is absolutely essential. And at the same time, what can you do for those parents who are a little bit uncomfortable with the linguistic diversity in, in school, who think maybe that this might end up lowering standards or holding their children back. So again, we're back to myths and attitudes. And this is a project that looks at all the research findings and presents them in a way that's user-friendly for parents. A nice leaflet that you could easily translate into, into your language to use with parents. And here's another one. And this one is about working with the wider community. Um, and if you look at the, the bullet points, this is a, a, an online course for teachers, which you can dip in and out of, and it covers these different elements. So what do you do to create an inclusive learning environment? How can you make space for learners' own languages? And within each of these areas, you have learn about it, try it, and explore it. The three elements here on on the slide. Um, anyone can, can link up to this uh, online course, so I would uh, recommend that you have a look. Um, some really lovely examples of, of children who've come to France, but in particular with many different languages, and who really have um, blossomed there because space has been given to their language and their culture, whilst um, strengthening their competences in the language of schooling. And here's another one. This is an ongoing project, so the, the outputs are not finalised, um, but again, it's focusing on learning and teaching in the early years. And the different segments, the different petals of the flower are all the elements that the experts are producing um, and that will be made available on the website very soon. But I'd like to mention here that two of the team members in this project, one from Luxembourg and one from Ireland, took part in a colloquium we ran uh, last December, presenting the situation in their countries. And of course, very different situations. Luxembourg, a trilingual country, and yet a country where many, many children do not come to school with any Luxembourgish and need to learn that as the language of schooling. And Ireland, a country a little bit like Scotland, not got a strong track record when it comes to languages, but now with many schools with children from all around the world and how these teachers um, change their approaches in order to support and integrate these children. I'd just like to mention the Irish school in, in particular in this context of linguistic diversity because in order to make things work, they developed certain principles. These were an inclusive ethos, an open language policy, absolutely no restriction on the languages the children used, either in class or in the playground. A strong emphasis on language awareness, which is the absolute foundation, and an, uh, an emphasis on the development of literacy in English, in Irish, in their home languages, something they did in collaboration with the parents, um, and of course in, in French, which was then introduced as a foreign language. 
And if you think of some of the things the teachers said, one of them said, when you bring in the home languages, the lights come on. I think that says a lot about how children learn. And when you and listen to the parents, there's one parent who said, when my child came home and told me that the teacher asked her to say something in Yoruba, I sat down and cried because I thought, at last, someone wants to know about our language. And I think these are really powerful messages from both learners and parents. And you can see that video and uh, online in, uh, through that link. I'm going fast because I, I want to sort of give you a whistle stop tour through, through these resources. This is another interesting project looking at a whole school approach to language learning. Because sometimes teachers feel quite alone. Um, and you need support from your colleagues, from colleagues in all subjects, but from head teachers too, and from parents. And here you've got some examples of projects tried out in different contexts and different countries, and small ideas that you could start in, in your own school. And what about the foreign language classroom? Here's a lovely project that looks at different foreign languages um, you can see there are worksheets prepared for teachers, there's answer sheets and PowerPoints, um, but it's also bringing in that element of intercultural learning. Um, so it's a kind of CLIL based project, but bringing in plurilingualism and intercultural learning, covering some really interesting topics that I'm sure you would find useful and all of this material you can access um, for free on the website. language as subject? What about those of you who are teaching the language of schooling, so French in France or German in Germany, who traditionally would have had learners in front of you who master that language, but perhaps that situation has changed now. This is a really lovely project that has produced another online study module um, looking at how to bring in the other languages while supporting development in the language of the host country. Um, and I would um, recommend that you, you take a little look in there. And one of the resources in there are these learner profiles. Now, this young person, Neslehan, who's a real person, you can learn all about her on, on the website, um, lives in Edinburgh, um, but has many, many different languages from home, um, but doesn't quite know how to connect one language with the other. And, and this for, for Neslehan is holding back her learning. So she's great at everyday English, but she can't do the academic English. And that's not just a problem for children from a migrant background, that's a problem for many disadvantaged children too. And she thinks that Turkish, which is her mother tongue, is only for the home. She's learning Spanish, but she can't see the link. And this gives you all sorts of tips to help Neslehan overcome these problems and to show her that what she has from her other languages is something very positive and very enriching, which can help her learning. I've included a, a, a link to a film about Moises. This is a little boy from Mexico who moves to the States. He's brilliant at mathematics and he's desperate to do well in his first maths test, but he's struggling with English. And he tries everything. He looks for clues on the wall. He uses his dictionary but he still can't access the language around the mathematical problem. It's a very moving film clip, and you see the kind of typical barriers that a child in this situation faces. You see how the teacher tries to help, but also doesn't know very well how to do this. And then it moves on to give you suggestions about how you could support a learner in his situation. Because the biggest risk for these learners is that they become completely disaffected um, and then they drop out of school and they don't reach their potential. And we as educators make, need to make sure that doesn't happen. When we think about language in subject, it's also, of course, a challenge for those of you who are subject teachers. So history teachers, whatever, geography, other subjects that we wouldn't traditionally consider to be language-based subjects. But of course, there is no learning without languages. So how do you make sure the language you use in your classroom is accessible to learners who do
do not have the language of schooling as their first language. And in this particular project, they developed descriptors for learners in history and in mathematics at the beginning of secondary school and then at the start of upper secondary based on the common European framework. And you can use these descriptors for all of these things listed here on the slide for raising awareness, for setting objectives, for assessment criteria, um, and making sure that the language you use is accessible. And of course, one of our most important tools, a tool that is now used in curricula in many different European countries, is this complete framework for pluralistic approaches to languages and cultures. And in that framework, you've got descriptors, knowledge, skills, and attitudes. We come back to attitudes, they, they, they are very, very important. But when we think about knowledge, we're talking about knowledge about different languages, knowledge about language in general, skills, how can we compare, how can we use the knowledge of one language to support another, and of course, attitudes, our sensitivity, our curiosity, our motivation. But in addition to the framework, there are all of these other sections now around the Karap Frepa project. And one of these is a link to a database of teaching material, which you can download and use in your classrooms with examples in many, many different languages. And here's just one of them. This whole thing about language awareness. Fairy tales are wonderful for this because they exist in almost all languages. Children know them. They don't need to know the languages here, but they can quickly compare and then they can work out where is the noun and how does that look differently in French or in German, Italian, Finnish? Where is the verb? Is the question word in the same place? So all of that metalinguistics that's so important as the basis for language learning. And it's like solving a puzzle. It's the kind of thing children really like doing. Um, and as one of the experts put it, um, you're inviting them to, to make a detour through other languages to access the, the language that they're actually working with. So I'm coming to an end in terms of um, the kind of, of resources that we have for you. But many of these, they're just some examples. There are, there are many, many more. And I wanted to finish up by actually telling you a, a little story, very short story, which is one of the activities on the Karap website that you could use with your learners, or in fact, with your colleagues in school. How about this, the story of a mouse? A mouse was walking around the house with her young. All of a sudden, they heard a cat. Mm -mm. The baby mouse was very, very frightened. The cat was coming closer. The mother mouse, mouse said to her baby, don't be afraid, listen. And to the young mouse's great surprise, she started barking. Woof, woof, woof. Now it was the cat's turn to be scared and it ran off. The mother turned to her baby and said, See how useful it is to be bilingual? That's the kind of little story you could use with your colleagues um, and with the learners in your classroom. It's fun, it's entertaining, but it's got a really important message behind it. So I would just really like to, to come to a close and remind us about those, those attitudes, our own attitudes and how they impact on the way in which we, we respond to our learners but also on the benefits of, of language learning and linguistic diversity. There's so much research now that's really showing the cognitive benefits of being able to operate in different languages, not just for the language learning, but across all subjects. The social benefits, that integration, that feeling part of a, of a community. Of course, the personal benefits. We've all made many friends from using our languages and, and getting to know people from different cultures and, and different countries. And now, of course, the health benefits, the, the fact that it's now been shown that it can help delay the onset of dementia, a very, very important benefit for those of us who are getting just a little bit older. And so on that note, I would like to, to come to a close and just say that actually, this is, this is about children, this is about the future, and it's also about building a better, more socially cohesive Europe. Um, the kind of Europe I think all of us together 
would want, oh, I jumped EDL, I'm going to come back to that, um, for our children and for all the world's children, because they all deserve to be valued and respected. And if I just for a second jump back, if you haven't celebrated today, here is a link to our website with lots of games, new facts have gone up about languages around the world, um, and lots of ideas that you can get involved in. There's also a video competition, the most multilingual classroom or workplace, and we would love you to take part. It will remain open um, for another couple of weeks. So I thank you all for um, listening, um, and I would be more than happy to take any questions, any questions Sarah, you well, might have. About the presentation or anything uh, she said or mentioned. I see there is a one. Um, do you have any, any questions? I see some of you said that you cannot see the pictures on the screen, but um, I'm very, yes, because for me it shows very clear, so I I don't know what could be the problem. But we will be sharing the slides with you, so you'll be able to see them anyways. Ooh. Any questions? Um, we can also take some questions at the end of the webinar if there's anything that you want to ask from Sarah. It's a very interesting presentation. Uh, what's the main site where we can find the resources? Oh. Yeah, I'll, I'll share the link in the chat. There's one question. Yeah, the actually website you. is www.ecml.at. From Edda, how many languages do you think a preschool child can learn? Thank you. Oh, yeah, okay. ECM. What do you mean by learn? Um, if we're talking about taking them to a specific level, or then I think that's a different question. If you're talking about a child just picking up the languages around them, there is no limit unless a child is actually diagnosed with a specific learning difficulty, um, they will absorb the languages around them. And of course, they will end up with, with competences in those languages at different levels, depending on whether they use them actively, simply hear them passively. Um, I simply would say, whatever is there, they should absorb it. Don't limit it in, in any way. And it always makes me think of that lovely quote from, okay, from, thank from you, Wittgenstein. Sarah. And then Veronica the limits has another question. Language How to explain to all world. the teachers of I think the school the importance sure of languages? Don't limit any child's world. Yes, that can be a challenge, can't it? Um, I think. Again, I would ask them those questions that I asked you at the beginning. What are the languages around you? What are the languages in your school? You know, it, it can be quite surprising to discover that in many schools, staff don't know that the children have other home languages or what those languages are. And one thing I would suggest all schools do is some kind of audit. You need to know what languages and cultures your children are bringing into your classroom. One thing you could certainly do is show them the presentation from the school in Ireland, because that really shows you how those children blossomed when their languages were brought in. And that helps overcome the myth that it might hold back their learning. Teachers need to see evidence that this is a good approach in order to change their beliefs. Um, and that would be one way I would suggest of, of doing it. But on the Maladive website, there's a lot of information about the benefits of, of language learning. And again, you could introduce that through a quiz um, in a fun way. We um, on to I think telling them that um, it might stave off um, dementia is, is usually, usually a good one. of growing up as a multilingualist? Yes, if I understood the question correctly. So yeah, is there a possibility of growing up as a multilingualist? 
do you mean growing up mastering many different so oh i lost Many, many young people are currently growing up um, multilingual, plurilingual. Um, I think that there's evidence of, of that all around us. But one of the myths, remember, at the beginning was that you would have exactly the same capacity or level or ability in each of the languages. That, of course, will not be the case. Um, but many young children and many, many people, many adults can switch comfortably from one language to the other so yes on. not only is it um, is it possible so how to um, explain the features of technical subjects the importance uh, to do CLIL modules mm -hmm. Well, um, I think, first of all, th there's a big question. There's a number of sub-questions in that question, aren't there? Are, do those teachers have the, the, the linguistic ability to, to deliver their subject through the medium of a different language? Um, and therefore, and then is there training in place to support them to, to be able to, to do that? And there are other um, webinars in this series that will focus more clearly on CLIL. But I think we have to start by saying to teachers that you, you would want to become involved in such a programme. You need to convince them of the benefits for the learner. And when they're convinced of the benefits for the learner, then they may be more willing to engage in that professional development and, and consider delivering their subject in the medium of another language or together with a, a colleague um, who, is a, a, who is a linguist. But there's another question there, and that is that many of us don't want to, are, are a bit embarrassed about the level we may have in a language. And usually we know more than we think we do. There's a confidence issue there. And I think we need to do very much more to support teachers to feel confident to use question. the languages uh, that What would we you have say to all those teachers who have a multilingual to, to classroom and are scared or a bit reluctant to work in this kind of environment? The first thing I would say is it's absolutely it's absolutely normal to be scared. Um, I think we have to recognize that. And then we need to talk to these teachers and say, this isn't about you suddenly having to master all of these languages because that's simply not possible. Um, it's about presenting to those teachers the, the benefits for the learners. I go back to the Irish presentation. In that particular school in Ireland, uh, those children, many of them came to school without any English and definitely without any Irish. And by bringing in their languages and gradually developing their literacy across all of the different languages, so their home language, English, Irish, and then later French, and um, with the parents, with support from the parents, those children did better than many other children in in nearby primary schools and their self-confidence and self-esteem was really fun, I mean, really supported and, and developed. Teachers need proof that this will work. They need evidence of it. They need to overcome their own fears and inhibitions and see that allowing that those languages into the classroom can actually create a richer learning environment for, for everyone. Think about those quotes from the parents and the teachers that I mentioned earlier and, and start with that. Start with a positive example and then you need to think about the kind For of the professional development. I advise keep on to those questions. To uh, we have to now move on to the next presentation, but afterwards there will be still do. opportunities to ask uh, more questions. So now thank you again, Sarah, for a very interesting presentation and answering some of the questions. And uh, the participants who ask a question, you can uh, hold on to those so it's just a little, little longer, because now we will have Gro coming to present uh, her project. Gro, can you hear us? Hello. 
Hello, girl. Are you able to hear us? Can you connect your microphone and the camera? Hello, now we can see you, but we cannot hear you. So can you connect your microphone again? Audio. Is it better now? Yes, it's working now. Um, it's working. I have your presentation. Yes, I have your presentation yeah. here ready, and uh, yeah. I have your video. So yeah, so that's so fun. This is our presentation, and uh, you can present your project. Yes, thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be invited to this webinar and uh, to talk to you today. Um, the day couldn't be better, the 26th of September, the European Language Day, uh, which we have celebrated in the school where I am as well. Um, as you can see on this first uh, presentation slide, this is the, the a poster that tells uh, the students where in the school where I am, uh, welcome to the school in many languages. Well, I will see if I can change the slide there, yes, the 26th of September. And uh, I will talk to you today, I will present the Wise Word Project, uh, which has received the European Language Label in 2017. And I will talk about benefits of language diversity in education. The program for the next 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, first, I will make a short presentation of me and what I'm doing as a job. I will tell a bit about uh, the research on bilingualism and uh, I will tell about the Wise Words campaign. And uh, then I will show examples of how I work with exposing the ling linguistic diversity on the school where I work. I also want to show how we are working with language profiles and at last I will give some examples of how to include the linguistic diversity in the education. My name is Gro, <clears throat> I'm a teacher uh, at a secondary school which is called School in Denmark. <laughs> I'm a French and a teacher and I also teach Danish, Danish as a second language uh, for the children of refugees, and now a days it's uh, it's often the Syrian children. I I I teach in language in subject. I'm award winner of the European Language Label 2017, and uh, then I have also been winning the prizes Teacher of the Year 2018. I'm very interested in bilingualism and. Uh, encouraging the pupils or the learners in using their language capacity. Um, I'm very attracted to the idea that uh, being bilingual is a great advantage, advantage and what pursued me about that was an article that referred to studies made by Judith Kroll and um, Ellen Bialy Stuck. And uh, Judith Kroll, uh, she is a uh, professor in, uh, in California and she has focused on second language acquisition and bilingual language processing. And Ellen B. Leistak is uh, from Canada and uh, her PA, PhD, uh, she made it with a specialization in cognitive and language development for children. It's so interesting what, uh, what they write about these two women, what they have found out about, about all <clears throat> the good things about uh, being bilingual. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, it, really, uh, it, it really was new for me to uh, what they had found out. So um, I will do it a bit quick. I will don't want to... Uh, but I will show you this one uh, because uh, that's uh, uh, as, uh, as Sarah said before. There's a lot of there are a lot of benefits about being uh, uh, multilingual, and uh, and this little video is about some of them.
Oh. Mm. Uh, bilinguals have long been considered a special group of language users because monolinguals were assumed to be the norm. Uh, and uh, much of the new research shows that it's a misconception to think that bilingualism complicates language and cognition, that children raised with input from two languages are dis disadvantaged. Um, to the contrary, recent evidence demonstrates that bilinguals develop a high level of cognitive control that enables them to negotiate the activity of the two languages. The experience of being bilingual comes to influence not only language but also cognition more generally and the brain networks that support language and cognition. I wanted to find out how my students felt about being bilingual and if they were asked to use their bilingual repertoire at school and therefore, I made a field study, including an interview, in which I asked a group of students to comment on if they had had the impression that all their languages were acknowledged as useful at school. I asked a group of students uh, from my French classes, and, uh, and here are four of them. It's uh, from the left, uh, Yasmina, her parents are from uh, Bosnia, and it's uh, Sahar, uh, the parents are from Afghanistan. Then we have Jup, her parents are from Vietnam, and Iman from uh, Morocco. Um, I was, uh, I was, I, I made a, I, I made a field study. I, I asked them a lot of questions uh, about being a bilingual. And the participants, they were surprised by the questions. It was all new for them that their languages, such as Bosnian, Arabian, Persian, Vietnamese, could be advantageous in learning at school. The students told me that instead of being proud of having several languages, they often felt ashamed of not being monolinguals. Even though they were some of the brightest minds in their classes, they were treated as if they couldn't catch up with the rest of the class on the simple fact that they were bilinguals. Not only was I astonished about how the school system does not acknowledge the linguistic resources, but the students were also surprised by the fact that no one seemed to care about their linguistic skills even though studies prove the benefits of bilingualism. On the basis of the newly acquired knowledge from my interview, we, the students and I, recognized the need of an information campaign in order to change the perception of the benefits of being bilingual. We therefore made a campaign, including a film and stickers, and uh, the campaign is meant to enlighten teachers as well as their students and hopefully parents and the government in an attempt to modernize the view of um, bilingualism. We have been invited to get several schools to speak for our course with a combination of research and the students' own experiences of being labeled as bilingual in the Danish school system. You will now see a little movie we make. In the movie, the students talk about the misunderstanding about being bilingual. So we'll see if it works, if it works. Laura here had the Mohima, stamina. What have you been doing with Pokon? Spro and Gail. Broden. Det sker stadig, at folk bliver overrasket, når jeg siger, at jeg taler dansk, og jeg taler godt dansk. Men altså, hvorfor skulle jeg ikke kunne det? Jeg er både født og opvokset i Danmark. Folkeskolen var jeg altid en af de bedste. Jeg blev altid sat på topholdene. Men hvis jeg lavede en fejl i en diktat, så blev det altid fremhævet, som om jeg bare var tosproget. Og det var okay. Men altså, alle de andre lavede de samme fejl. 
Oh, I must stop it there because uh, <laughs> I thought I had sent a film with um, with subtitles because we made it with subtitles. This is in Danish. I don't think it gives uh, <laughs> sense for you. I don't know if uh, you can find it in uh, with subtitles in English because that could be so much yeah, better. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, unfortunately, the subtitles didn't really transfer to the video, but we will put the we will put the link to the YouTube video so all the participants can go and if they click the link, they can go and watch it on YouTube and have the subtitles there. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's so good. Oh, it's a pity we cannot see it here, but uh, yeah, it's on YouTube and uh, uh, yeah. Um, when we are visiting the schools, uh, we show the pupil this, um, this film, and the film is actually about the benefits of having many languages. But it's also about how uh, these uh, young people have been treated as bilinguals. How they have met a world that was not understanding to their languages and how their languages had never ever been included in school. It's such a pity and it's such a good thing to tell the children that they, that they shall not be ashamed about the, the languages that they have, that they must be proud of the languages, that it shapes the, uh, that the languages shape their brain and, uh, and we tell them about all the studies that are made. And this photo, I, I really like it. You see Samale from, uh, his parents are from Somalia and all the youngsters, they are, up and ask him um, about their language. Uh, is it good? I'm a Romanian kid. Uh, is my language also a good language and things like that? It's so good having these youngsters out on the schools because uh, they become role models. Uh, Samali he tells the young uh, the children how um, how his mother she speaks to him in uh, in Somalian. But he is not able to speak to her in Somalia, but he understands everything that she says. And a lot of, of yeah, children comes up and, and says to him, wow, that's also like that uh, with me at home. When we are um, out visiting the schools, we also ask how many languages they are represented at the schools. We simply ask the children to stand up when we say out their language. And it's so touching seeing this transformation it makes in the children's faces when they are told that also their language is a gift. We have stickers uh, along and uh, the children uh, they have a sticker and the idea about the stickers is that um, they can bring the stickers uh, at home and then uh, they can tell the parents about uh, what they have been uh, uh, hearing and uh, why it's good to learn other languages, why it's good to, uh, to, to speak another language at home and why it's a good idea to, uh, to continue speaking the language at home and, uh, and also uh, go to school, Vietnamese school, Tamil school, um, Arabian school to learn about more about the language. Um, and uh, and you know when the young people when they when they are telling their parents about the project uh, when they say it in their own way uh, sometimes it can uh, it can give them a better idea of what it's all about. <laughs> um, and here's a boy as well and some as you can see uh, on this school I don't know if you can see it because it's in Danish but. Uh, we counted 49 languages and uh, and it's uh, the language from Inuit to um, that you speak up north to Volo that you speak in, speak in Senegal and uh, yeah there's a lot of languages in this uh, school but all over the schools there are a lot of languages and we uh, often discover that the teachers they do not know the richness of languages that are represented 
at their schools. So it's so good to to make to to make them be aware of uh, of uh, the diversity of languages presented at their schools. Um, my purpose uh, is to uh, is to make the the children proud of their languages. And now you couldn't hear uh, the video, or you could hear it, but it was not subtitled. But but some of the children they say that they were not proud of it. That the language uh, the when they spoke their language at school, or the teachers often said to them, "You don't have to speak Bosnian here because." Uh, uh, you are maybe you are uh, you are defaming some of the other uh, uh, learners or some of the other children and and uh, and I really want to to make the language visible at the school where I'm working. So um, so therefore I have made this uh, project uh, outside on every uh, class door. The, the class or the pupil in the class, they have uh, written how many languages they have in the classroom. And uh, as you can see, I have asked the pupils to write down. And, uh, and it's the language in their repertoire. That, and it's so important to tell the children that it's in the repertoire because it's uh, not languages that they can speak. But it can be like Somali, it can be Somalian, because he understands what his mother, he understands when his mother is talking to him, uh, and he has a, a big uh, um, knowledge about the Somalian language, even though he doesn't speak it himself. In seven A, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but the the the, root, the languages that they have in this class, it's Danish, English, German. Italian, Albanian, Norwegian, Swedish, Vietnamese, Sioux, Burmese, Turkish, Thai, Arabian, and French. And in the class beside, the, they also have Italian, Faroese, Spanish, and Greenlandic. Uh, as I was told, it's so important that the children are able to see other languages than Danish in their school, so therefore I have asked the children to write, write down sentences in one of their many languages. And as you can see, they have written words down in Armenian, Arabian, Spanish, Russian, Vietnamese, Japanese, Greenlandic, Polish, Norwegian, and Swahili. <laughs> So uh, it's such a good and very simple way of showing all the languages uh, presented at school. And as Sarah says, it really makes a difference if you can see that you also your languages language is represented at school. Um, in order to draw attention to the linguistic repertoire, even pupil, every pupil also works out a language profile. And a language profile, it's actually very simple, but it's a, it's a drawing that the pupils made. Um, they are, they are, it's, it's just a paper with this uh, figure on. And uh, then uh, before they make it, I ask them some questions. And uh, it's about which language do you have in your repertoire? Which language do you speak at home? Which language do you speak with your grandparents? And in which language do you think? In which language do you dream? In which language do you speak in your summer holidays? Which words are your favorites and why? And which language do you prefer to express emotional feelings in? And then the children, they make, uh, they make out uh, a drawing like this. And then around the man, they describe the languages that they have been painting in the man. Uh, it's so interesting to see the profiles that the children make. It really is. And it gives the teachers such a good clue about the languages uh, represented in the children. Uh, 
uh, I have made a little observation. I have made a lot of profiles and every time I make it, I do never say uh, which language they had to put where, but it's always the language of the mother tongue or the home language that is represented in the heart. And I think it's such uh, it's it's so important because it's so important for the identity that the um, and 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 when it is important for the identity, it always sh it also shows me as a teacher that it is so important to bring it out in school. Uh, here we have more uh, uh, children uh, making the repertoire. Uh, it's uh, it's also very interesting to see that they have everybody has put has put a uh, danish in the head and uh, they write that it's because they think in danish but they feel with another language yeah you can see the the profiles are, are um, represented in the classroom uh, and uh, yeah, it's such an easy way of uh, of um, working, or, or it's such an easy tool for the for the teachers to have because when you have this profile, you can easily use the the languages and the knowledge and the diversity diversity uh, that the uh, that the children. Um, uh, health, uh, because then you you know about the language, and every time we make it, <laughs> uh, I, I I I see things that I didn't know. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's uh, it's really a brilliant idea. I can just recommend it. Um, when I uh, I. As I said before, I'm a linguistic, uh, I'm a French teacher and uh, I work a lot with the linguistic diversity in class and oh, this is a movie as well and I cannot, I cannot, uh, I cannot bring it on. Well, do you have it? No. Uh, but uh, such a shame. <laughs> but uh, it was about how um, Working with the with the linguistic diversity in class, and how uh, some how I have made some um, some some uh, similar similarities between French and Arabic language, uh, because uh, these uh, children that I have in class, they are I. Um, they are. They have a lot of, uh, of languages represented in in their in their brains and their minds. And when they have these uh, languages represented, uh, it's uh, it's it's you as a teacher. You have to bring the uh, curiosity uh, to the children. And I always say in my lessons, French lessons. Well. Uh, it's in this way in French. How do you do it in Vietnamese? How do you do it in Arabia? How do you do it in Thai? You know, and we have so many linguistic uh, conversations uh, in my classes. In the beginning, children or the students, they often think, uh, oh, they are a bit ashamed. But, uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Yeah. So you are able to show it the video. Bonjour. Bonjour tout le monde. Bonjour. Ça va? Ça va bien. Aujourd'hui, nous Nous allons travailler avec le film Le voyage de Fanny. Je l'ai dit et vous allez répéter. Écrit par. Écrit par. Écrit par. 
thank you very much. I'm, uh, what we just saw was that uh, this girl, uh, Lina, she explains to the others uh, that she knows uh, what the French word uh, uh, Almania, Almania, uh, uh, that it means uh, Germany, because it's the same in Arabian. Uh, and uh, and what she also is, uh, knows a lot about it's uh, how to make uh, the sentences in French because it's the same way that you do it in Arabian and in French. So because I have made this uh, um, profile and because I know her that her uh, that she's bilingual in Arabian, I can use the Arabian knowledge in my French classes. And it is so good. And I really can feel that the youngsters, as you see here, I have uh, I have mainly young people from 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old. And most of them really uh, love when I ask them to the uh, other languages that they uh, that are uh, represented in their minds. As you saw, uh, I had these uh, laps of paper uh, where I, I write uh, French words on. And it's so good to make uh, when, you, when you discuss a, a language in this way. As you can see, the students, they discuss what's on their, uh, what's on their paper. And, uh, and when they do that, I always say to them, use all the language that you know when you have to, to find out what means this French words. Uh, it's such a good uh, idea to uh, uh, work with the vocabulary and to enlarge the uh, vocabulary of the, of the children. Yes. Um, here I have, uh, it's all also a French lesson. Uh, we have talked about the number order, the order and number. You know, in uh, in Danish, we also we always say um, say. Uh, uh, do, 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 do. I have to find it here. Um, we all always say start by the first digit in the numbers, and then um, and then uh, we take the last digit. Uh, no, we start in Denmark, excuse me, in, in Danish and in German, we start by the last digit and then the first digit when we make numbers. And in French and Arabia, it's uh, the other way around. You start by the last digit and um, you start by the first digit. <laughs> and these, this girl has been at home to ask, how is it in Tamil? And uh, her parents uh, helped her in finding out. And, and, and now she writes for the classmates uh, how, uh, how it's written in Tamil, the numbers. And this girl, uh, Sahar from uh, Afghanistan, she shows her, her classmates how to conjugate verbs in Persian. <clears throat> And uh, um, you can see, uh, I have always also written down how conjugate verbs in French, and she is doing the same, but in Persian. Uh, and we are describing the difference, and uh, the classmate sees uh, how she is writing from the um, from the right to the left, and how she is making the letters, and uh, they. They were really wow after having seen this um, uh, Sahar writing in, 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 in this way. And on this photo, it's uh, Andre from Romania who had taught the class about the uh, Romania um, weekdays. And you, as you see, we have uh, uh, the weekdays in Romania, in the middle in French and at last in Danish. And, um, and uh, we have had a lot of discussions about 
uh, the similarities and the and the gods, so the Greek mythology and the, and the, how the how the week stay, the day of the week I. Uh, do uh, uh, named after the gods. <laughs> so, uh, so I feel that the people are so motivated to um, to uh, to uh, share their their knowledge in other language in classroom because I say to them that what they have is so important and they just have to be proud and and uh, I tell them about all the advantages and therefore they um, they have the will to share uh, with their classmates. Um, yeah, these were all examples and how you can uh, how you can deal with the uh, the languages in classroom and uh, how you can work with the uh, language diversity in classroom and I would really recommend you to uh, to try <laughs> and uh, especially to try to make the profiles because uh, you will discover that uh, it's uh, it's it's really brilliant for the pupil but also for you to see uh, the richness of uh, languages in their in their repertoire. At last, I have found out some. Uh, you know, there's a lot of there are a lot of videos uh, about the benefits of uh, a bilingual brain, and uh, this I have found it in uh, in YouTube, but uh, and it's not the only one. <laughs> and uh, here uh, are some articles. Uh, you can. Um, you can write down Judy, Judy Kroll or Ellen B. Livestock and you will can read a lot of articles about their uh, research. It's so interesting and it's so good when you are talking to the pupils that you are aware of all the good things uh, about having several languages. <laughs> um, yes, the last thing I have made here is uh, you know I'm from Denmark and uh, we have a very famous uh, storyteller H. C. Anderson and he made this story about the ugly duck and um, and uh, I've put that on the last slide because uh, that's what I have been seeing with the uh, young students that I have made this wise word campaign with that uh, in the beginning they felt ashamed about using their languages and uh, and being bilingual, but uh, now they have spread out the wings and they uh, and they have recognized the swans that they are. So uh, that's um, a fine picture to end with. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening. For your interesting presentation, I see people really excited about it in the comments <laughs> as well. Just um, if you have any questions, just uh, put them mm -hmm. in the chat box. But meanwhile, while you're thinking and typing. There was one question um, while you were presenting uh, from Ruud. Um, it's asking, do you have any interesting ideas for new arrived or newly arrived pupils to help them to feel more accepted and to underline the gift of being bilingual? Like, what would you be a suggestion for the newly arrived? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm working with newly arrived and the girl you saw in the video, she is also a newly, newly arrived. Uh, so uh, what I will really recommend to work with is the language in the, in the, how do you call it, in the subject. Uh, because when you work with the language in the subjects, uh, and that could be another webinar, how to do that, <laughs> uh, you really, um, uh, make it a lot more easier for the new arrivals to uh, to participate in the education. But uh, but otherwise, uh, I will uh, um, if you if you tell these students the newly arrived that uh, Danish is not just a brand new language. They have a lot of a lot of knowledge to. Uh, to go uh, to use when they are uh, learning this language. 
um, because of course it is a new language, but but they are not. Um, but they already have some tools to uh, to begin with. Uh, then I I have experience that it's a big help for them. Uh, and then I'm so interested in the, in their uh, in their languages, and they can feel that I'm really interested in their languages. So therefore, they feel that their languages are welcome in um, in school. I have. Uh, always, uh, also, I'm always, I'm mixing up always and also, but I have also made some uh, uh, in some classes where the new arrivals they had to learn uh, the classmates, uh, for example, to tell uh, count to ten in Romania or count to ten in Arabian, or, and um, and everybody loves the idea of learning a new a, a new language. So that's also an, an idea to uh, to welcome the new arrivals and the new languages. Yes. <laughs> I had a question from Vasiliki, who is also a French language teacher, asks, have you worked on an interdisciplinary project where you combine languages with other topics? Excuse me, where topic. I combine language with? Mother topic, yeah, that's a, uh, yeah, that's exactly what I do. I, I all the time I compare the French or the language with their mother topic, um, uh, because uh, as you saw uh, the example with this uh, Romanian guy, I can just find it here. I ask them to uh, write the here it's in French, but it it could have been in social social studies or Danish or math or. Uh, anywhere where you have a language and the language is all over, I ask them to uh, to write down in their own mother tongue and then uh, beside the new language that they are learning. Mm. Francesca, would you suggest using plurilingual sorry posters to work on vocabulary? Do you think it could be useful to compare and contrast explicitly two or more languages? Yeah, I think it's a good idea to make uh, posters. I think it's a good idea to make a lot of um, of things uh, visual uh, to to yeah as I as I did with the with the with the posters of the language around school and things like like that. I think it's such a good idea to to uh, to write down the languages and. Uh, and make it all around the school so that the children can recognize themselves in the school. Because it's also about re recognizing uh, that the children, they can see that, oh, this school, it's also for me. It's not just uh, for the Danish pupil. Uh, because they all, all the time, they just see things in Danish. But um, some uh, uh, around the school, I have put up like the Tamilian uh, alphabet, the the uh, the weeks uh, in day of the weeks in Arabian, and and uh, it's so interesting to see because there's always a lot of uh, students scattering around these posters to see uh, if they know what it's understands so uh, if they know what what stands on them and uh, uh, just to uh, to uh, to gather around uh, the posters uh, if you are uh, from Syria for example it can uh, be good for you to to that oh there's something i can rely on my my languages are, is also represented on this school so it makes you feel uh, comfort, um, and uh, and I think that it's so important that the school that we make represents all the students that we have. Other questions? Um, I think there was one question earlier for Sarah. So Sarah, if you are still with us, yeah. So there was an earlier question for you uh, from Paula. If you know any recent studies about less percentage of dyslexia among bilingual children. Ongru also, if you have any views on this, but Sarah Ongru, any 
about the recent studies on dyslexia among bilinguals. Uh, it, um, Excuse yeah, me, was it for me? For you and Sarah, if you have any, have you heard about uh, this? Oh. Um, uh, uh, no, I haven't heard about uh, about that. I think that it can, yes, uh, dyslexia is, uh, uh, is uh, it can appear uh, everywhere, <laughs> but uh, I don't know that. I I haven't heard that it has especially to do with with bilingualism. Uh, um, I'm not aware of, of, of recent studies, um, but I I think. I certainly know there have been studies done, for example, on um, children with autism and if, for whom, for example, when they were introduced to Chinese because it's a very visual language and um, really responded very, very positively to it. Um, but I could um, I could search for something if you would like, but I, I don't off the top of my head know of any recent studies. Um, about dyslexia and uh, bilingualism, sorry. Any other questions for the presenters? There's one, if students aren't stimulated, how we can do, so how can the teachers stimulate the students? How can... Uh, uh... Um, yeah, that's a really good. <laughs> that's a really good question because uh, uh, I think that the main topic uh, by us, the teachers, is to stimulate the the children, and uh, we can do it in several ways. Uh, I try to stimulate the children that I work with with the uh, with languages and uh, and. Uh, uh, my knowledge about the languages uh, are, uh, are, are very important and uh, I think that some people, a lot of them, get inspired and stimulated by that. Um, but I don't know, Sarah, if you have I, I totally agree, idea. Uh, Gro, I think I think one of the things is um, personalized learning and I, I think that, you know, just as you've been saying, Gro, all about their, their identities and their languages, it's looking for topics and um, subject matters that they can bring to the classroom, not always the teacher determining what the, the topic's going to be. Um, and this notion that um, Jim Cummins developed about identity texts, allowing them to talk about um, their way of life and, and bring their own world in, into the classroom. Um, and I think when, when young people feel that their identity is respected and valued, then they start being motivated to learn. It's, it's all part of it. Um, it. It's the most important part is making them feel valued. And, and as Gro has so beautifully demonstrated, showing them that they have so much to bring to their learning um, that the, the teacher can build on. Mm. I think that's, that's really the key. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Uh, for answering and taking the question. Unfortunately, we're running a bit out of time here. We're already 20 past um, six. So I was wondering if the, um, both you, Sarah and Gro, if you have any email address where the participants can contact you for if they have any further questions for you. Um, it has been, as you can see, it's been very, in, uh, very yes. interesting presentations yes. and the participants have so many questions. So this would be nice to continue the discussion. I've just put it in the chat. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, I will do as well. So <laughs> afterwards, so we definitely share the recording and the presentation with all of you. So it will be available on School Education Gateway's collaborative spaces as well as the MOOC pages. So if I can maybe just go to the end of the presentation. So here you can take the feedback survey, and you take the you can take the poll. And also, if you haven't already, you can sign up for the Teacher Academy MOOC, Embracing Language Diversity. I'm just going to put the link where you can sign up in the chat box. So if you're more interested about language and language diversity in classrooms, join the MOOC. It's just started this week, so 
there's still plenty of time um, to catch up on that. And I would like to say so many thank yous to Sarah and Guru for taking their time and to come and, pre and present. It was really inspirational. And I can see that the participants really have enjoyed it as well. And I want to thank all of you to coming and staying with us and asking the questions. Unfortunately, this is a run out of time, but we can still continue with the discussion and there will be materials that we will be sharing with you. So thank you everyone. Mm. And I want to wish you a very nice evening. You're